We're going to talk to Gary DiCarlo of the uh, band Steam, the original member. And uh, I talked to him a little earlier, did a little pre-production on the way over here. How's the audio, Jeff? We're using a Sennheiser. Hello. Gary DiCarlo. Good man. I was watching the PBS uh, special, your performance of Na Na Hey Hey Kiss Him Goodbye again tonight. Boy, it's so great. It's up on YouTube. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the it's it's gone. It's getting close to six thousand hits. So it's it's people are uh, becoming aware of it. it and I I, I got uh, someone just called me and uh, sent me a letter the other day. I guess they had. Seen it? Uh, they were airing it down in, uh, Ken, in in Kentucky, and uh, he he wrote me and um, told me how great he thought it was, and you know that that I sounded really good on it. So I was I was very surprised, and I was uh, really happy to hear that. Now I told you in one of our interviews that when I saw it on PBS, I thought it was the record. Watching it again on YouTube, I'm still amazed at how tight. Not only your voice, and, and you, you sound like exactly like the record, but so was the back. The accompaniment was amazing. Yeah, the house band was, was unreal. The, what I thought was great, too, was that they obviously listened to the record uh, after we had done the rehearsal, you know. And, um, and then when they came back and we did the, the live show, he, the drummer uh, like got down the percussion part and then they added in like the the uh, the piano and the uh, vibe parts and stuff. And and you're right, it did sound very very close to it. Now the vibe parts were they put into a keyboard so they could uh, play them back? The, I'm sorry, to what? Did they play the vibes live or did they? Yeah, they, they had a they had a set of vibes up on the stage that night. Yes. Totally amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I thought so too. So. Uh, you know, you look so youthful in the video, and you sound so young. It's just amazing. Um, for these PBS, you know, the PBS crowd is a bunch of gray hairs, and you young rockers were up there rocking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they they were great too. Uh, you could see in the in the video that uh, the the whole place was standing up and they were singing and they're having a good time. Uh, I I get that kind of a response uh, uh, usually every time that I do it, and people come up and relate really happy good stories about what they were doing at the time and it, it's uh, it's a good feeling so there's this rapper out there with a name um fancy and it's not the band fancy that had the hit wild thing the rapper did not nah, nah, hey hey kiss him goodbye it's an expensive video too really yeah so there's a cd of it and it's on eBay. I saw it tonight. I was looking because that's where I do a lot of my research. I wrote a couple of pages I sent to you. And I look on eBay, Gary, and I can get like the picture of the 45 instantly and zero in on the publisher and the, the time of the record and everything. Yeah, I was, uh, as a matter of fact, I was looking at the, uh, at the uh, stuff that you sent, and, and it's great. I, I love it. You mean I might have potential as a writer down the road? I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I've only written about 10,000 articles. Yeah. I, well, hey, Joe, you gotta give, you got to get good after a while, right? <laughs> what, was, what was fun was I sat down and I saw your email and I said, okay, let me bang one out. And I banged that out within an hour. Yeah, well, you have a knack for it, man. Uh, believe me. You, you can see they're very, very polished, very professional. And, and you, know, you hit on some very good points. We haven't even polished it yet. That's the rough draft. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. So for for you to just you know whack that out in that short of a uh, time, right? And you and you didn't really talk to to uh, Joe T, right? No, I just emailed it to you and him. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. So you know, with both of your heads together, it'd be come out great. You know, it's the YouTube world. I mean, the um, the the internet. You know, in the old days, I'd be at the library and there'd be information on these teletype things that I'd get, you know, writing an article. And then you'd get books off the shelf, and you'd have to pour through the books. 
uh, that one hour would have taken me three hours. Yeah. So things have changed in, in a good way if you know where to find what you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely right. I, I agree with you. Well, that, that, that's what amazes me, too, about the young kids today. They have so much at their disposal for, for showing you know, their, their talents and stuff, which uh, we didn't have back in those days. You well, know, you had to go and door knock and do things totally different. There's a downside to it, and I'm going to bring it up, and that is uh, the kids today have too much information. So the when you made a record back in the day, Gary, even if you had four tracks or six tracks or eight tracks, and some of the Sam Cooke stuff was done on three-track machines. Yeah, yeah I know what you mean. Yeah. But, you know, even in the old days, two tracks for uh, Frank Sinatra and a big band. Yep. So you had to get it right the first time. Uh, or if the Rolling Stones were making Beggar's Banquet on a four-track, they would uh, mix down the four-track and then open up two more tracks, but everything sounds so good 50 years later. Yeah, yeah, you have to have, you have, to have the ears to be able to put the rhythm section together, right, like you said, put it down onto one track and then open up more tracks and then, and then, and then have an idea of, of what you want to do so that you could at least have some tracks for your vocals so you could finish up. But yes, yeah, I know what you're saying, believe me. Well, here's my feeling about some of the kids, not all of them today, because some are purists and will go back. They don't understand what analog recording was. They don't understand how meticulous some artists were putting these things together and why that you need to go back to the future, if you will. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. You know, we know what it is, too, now. You, they have the, uh, the the virtual tracks where you could have 148 tracks going at once. I mean, it's like, how many tracks do you need? <laughs> you know, you could make a decent record on an 8-track or a 16-track, you know, and, and 24 is plenty. Well, I think the magic number is 88. Want me to give you my reasoning? Yes. All right. Some of my favorite records in the 70s, don't laugh, were the records produced by the Bee Gees. Oh, I love the Bee Gees. So when they did Heartbreaker for Dionne Warwick and they did um, Barbara Streisand's Guilty album with A Woman in Love, what a great song, and, and uh, Andy Gibb and all these great things, Yvonne Elliman, they were producing. They had, I guess, they would sync up two 24-track machines and have 48. Ah. But when you sync those tracks up, you lose four tracks that you need to sync up the machines with. Yeah. So 48 tracks become 44, then they had another two 24-track machines, so they had 96 tracks, which turned into 88 tracks. Wow. Those great BJ's, Bee Gees records were How Deep Is Your Love, uh, Fanny B. Tender. Those were cut on 88 tracks. Wow. I wouldn't think they would need that many tracks, but, but the, you're right. The recordings were, were really, really good. The guitar, the guitar was such a full sound, especially on... Uh, the uh, what was that for the for the movie with uh, Travolta, John Travolta? Saturday Night Fever. Saturday Night Fever, yeah. The the the, the guitar part on that blew me away. It, it was so so thick and rich, and it was just a simple little line that he was playing, but it was so effective. Well, Albie Galutin was one of the producers. They had two co-producers, but those records were rich. They had depth. Yeah. And you play a, a Rolling Stones record done on four track and a Bee Gees done on 96, and you can play both on the radio next to each other. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yep. So, so the big question, how many tracks did you use for Na Na Hey Hey Kiss Him Goodbye? That was done on eight tracks. It was an eight track studio. They, Mercury had a 16 track at the time, but, but uh, we just used the eight track. Was it like one inch tape? How's that for a guess on an 8-track, 1-inch? One yep, 1-inch. One and you needed 16 tracks would have 2-inch? Yep. Yeah, they, they use that, um, you know, for, for uh, let's see, uh, what, what was his, uh, Buddy Miles. Buddy Miles came in, and, um, and he was recording up there, and they were in the 16-track studio. So I wonder where those tapes are, if, if Uni has them in the vaults. I would assume, because I don't know if Paul had them. Uh, I know he had them when uh, after it was recorded, but I don't know what happened to him after that. 
and and I know that there was remixes that were done, but uh, again, I don't know, you know, where the tapes are or who has them or what. Oh, we should investigate that. We should talk to uh, Universal Music first out in California. They might have them. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. At least they'd have the two-track master and some of the mix downs, maybe. Yeah, well, there, there was only one. That was only it was only one mix. Of that song? Yeah, it was only one mix. Now, you used a backing track to another tune you had recorded. Yeah, that was the drum track from a, a song called Sugar by uh, Neil Sedaka. And um, it was a, a, a black uh, a, a studio drummer from New York City called Jimmy Johnson. And um, that was pulled and it was made an eight-bar loop. And then everything was, was uh, added onto it. Now, can we find that original Sugar? Do you have a copy of that? Uh, I think I do, yes. I think I do. I, I don't know if I have it. I think I have it in a demo form, though. Uh, you know, the, the um, where they sound test it before, right before it's pressed. Because uh, it never came out. Boy, we got to see if we can track those down, because that would make a nice collectible box, the story of Nana Hey Hey, Kiss Him Goodbye. Yeah, yeah, I, I have that. I, I think I also have... Um, uh, Sweet Laura Lee, I think, and I have, uh, what was the, uh, uh, Van McCoy, I, I can't remember the name of it. A Van McCoy song? Yeah, it was a Van McCoy song. Bobby Hebb did For You, um, and Van McCoy, of course, hit with The Hustle. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This would, he hit with that afterwards, after, uh, the, uh, the Na Na thing, but, um, it, it, it was kind of hard picking out picking out some of the songs because some of the songs that I wanted to do, um, you know, Paul didn't uh, didn't like the songs. You know, I don't know if he felt that that uh, you know he would he, he didn't know what to do with them uh, as far as arrangement or what. But you know, then we wound up whittling it down and finally getting to those four. So I'm having uh, Hershey's Kisses here. While I'm um, uh, talking to you from the party last night, we had our Wind Cam Christmas party. Oh. So if Hershey's isn't going the way of Twinkies, maybe they'll do a Hershey's Kisses. Na na hey hey, Hershey's Kisses. Hello. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know. We we'll get we we'll get the right. We we'll get them to sing it too. I'm holding up the little kiss on, on the um, oh, a green one. How Christmassy! <laughs> I got green and red. Hey, I'm a chocolate freak. But, um, no, I want to call you up and wish you happy holidays. Well, same to you, Joe. And, um, you have something coming up with, uh, the Monkees concert? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Davy Jones passed away, and, uh, he was the co-host on the PBS special that I did, uh, along with, uh, Peter Noonan. And, and after that, uh, I... Through uh, Charles Rosenay and and this um, uh, other woman, uh, I forget her name, a Phyllis. Uh, anyway, it, it, they asked me if I would be a guest because of that, because of Davy, and uh, I said yes. And and that's coming up March first, uh, second, and third of uh, 2013 at the Meadowlands in New Jersey. Oh, so it's three nights. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I was told. Three nights supposed to be now. Now recently, I just saw it advertised, and I saw um, March first. But originally, what I was told was it's uh, the first, second, and the third. Because there's quite a few people that are uh, that have come on board, and um, from what I understand, they have already sold out four hotels there already. Wow. Yeah, so so I, I get emails, it's amazing, from people from all, all over the world, uh, you know, wanting to know questions, you know, like answers, and, and I, I don't really know because I'm only a guest, you know, so then, then I, I, uh, I hook them up with, uh, with the Phyllis uh, site, and then they get their answers. Hold on, Gary. Hey, Jeff, I don't see the um, logo up on the uh, monitor, so uh, I guess... Uh, but we're talking to Gary DiCarlo here 
and singer who has just uh, put a new band together. And where was the last gig you did? Oh, I did a show at the uh, Downtown Cabaret in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. And uh, it was a good night. We packed the place, and I got 75 emails the next day from people uh, saying what a great time they had and, you know, when am I going to do it again? And and the, even the band, the band really had a good time. So it was, it was a good night, Joe. Any video on YouTube? Uh, there, there is, but it's just Nana. Uh, it, there's a video of uh, me singing it, and then there's a video of me thanking uh, WICC and um, Weeby 108, which, uh, which, you know, had me on for uh, radio interviews and, and then came to the show also. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. They're, they're good people. So what else did you play that night? And then we'll get you off the hot seat. Uh, you mean as far as songs? Yeah. Yeah, I did a, I did a lot of uh, a cover things, but stuff that I used to do when I was working the area back in the 60s. I did a lot of R&B stuff, you know, uh, Nadine, I did uh, Knock, Knock on Wood, I did, um, let's see, what else? I did a, a medley with uh, Midnight Hour and, and um, let's see, uh, Mary Mac, that's about, uh, 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 Sounds like a good uh, rock and set. Uh, yeah, and then, and then, uh, Rufus Thomas, Rufus. I made a move a few tables so that there was a dance floor for the people, and, and I'll tell you, they came up on a dance floor and they packed it. And and they, I'm telling you, Joe, they they had a really really good time. They stayed later because there was, uh, um, you know, quite a few people, and they just wanted to stand around. They wanted to talk and come up and say hello and meet the band and stuff. So it was nice. It was a good night. Gary, we know you're busy. It's the holiday season. Thank you so much for uh, participating with our show tonight. Uh, thank you, Joe. Happy holidays, man. Same to you, man. All right. Thanks. Take care. Gary DiCarlo. Hey, Jeff Dearman. How we sounding? Sounding good? I don't see the logo. Does it not come up? Uh, computer's down? Oh, sorry, man. Um, Jeff Dearman's here. He's the dancing usher at the Boston Garden.